Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, The Role of Cloud Providers and Semiconductors in Open RAN. Before we get started, I'd like to go over a few items so you know how to participate in today's event. You've joined the presentation listening using your computer speaker system by default. If you would prefer, if you have any technical issues, please use the questions box to let, let us know. Today's webinar is being recorded and will be available for viewing on the Open RAN Policy Coalition website. You will also have the opportunity to participate in today's webinar by submitting text questions to presenters by typing your questions into the questions pane of the control panel. I would now like to introduce Diane Rinaldo, Executive Director of the Open RAN Policy Coalition. Wonderful, thank you for that. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for tuning in for another roundtable series with the Open RAN Policy Coalition. Today's segment will be the role of cloud providers and semiconductors in Open RAN. We have heard from many of you that there's an interest to peel back the onion and focus on the innovation within Open RAN, and today's event is kicking off that initiative. Advancements in 5G had led to a faster and more intelligent net networks, offering mobile network operators the ability to reach and serve more customers while expanding the mobile ecosystem into nearly every industry worldwide. As part of the 5G transformation, there have been a huge uptick in solutions, allowing for the integration of open and interoperable interfaces into the radio access network. Standardizing and developing, developing open interfaces ensures interoperability across different players and lowers the barrier to entry for new innovators, including cloud providers and semiconductor vendors. I am pleased to have the Open RAM Policy Coalition founding member and chairman and CEO of XCOM Labs, Paul Jacobs, join us today to keep note this segment. XCOM Labs is a perfect example of how lowering the barrier to entry allows new entrants into the marketplace. Paul is the former CEO and executive chairman of Qualcomm, where he spearheaded its efforts to develop and commercialize fundamental, fundamental mobile technology breakthroughs that have fueled the wireless internet and smartphone revolutions that we see today. He is a prolific inventor with more than 80 patents granted or pending in the field of wireless technology and devices. He also serves as the director of Dropbox, First, and Heal, which is a private technology enabled medical care company. Now, my favorite Paul Jacobs statistic is that he is the owner and vice chair of the Sacramento Kings, has competed in the National uh, Basketball Association. He attended the University of California, Berkeley, where he earned a BS in electrical engineering and computer science, an MS in electrical engineering, and a PhD in electrical en engineering and computer science. He has also founded the Berkeley's Jacobs Institute for Design and Innovation and was the university's 2017 Alumnus of the Year. Dr. Jacobs is a member of the National Academy of Engineering and a fellow of the American Academy of Art and Science. Paul, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, the floor is yours. We look forward to hearing from you. <clears throat> Thanks, Dan, for having me. I kind of feel like that intro was about as long as my keynote, so uh, thanks for that. But uh, Anyways, uh, <clears throat> super happy to be talking to everybody today. And uh, as Diane said, you know, I was running Qualcomm and now running uh, XCOM, which is a little startup that I uh, started with uh, three of my partners from uh, Qualcomm, Derek Aberly, who was our president at one point around a licensing business, and Matt Grob, who was the uh, CTO. We got about 80 employees. We're in San Diego and Bangalore. Uh, we've been in stealth a bit, uh, but we basically, are coming out now. Um, we have three products, a cellular product, an unlicensed band product, and uh, a thing that does real-time multimedia. And basically, the wireless technology that we're working on pretty much increases the cellular capacity and ease of deployment without making changes to existing standards, and we can use off-the-shelf phones and so forth. And we focused a lot of effort on uh, augmented and virtual reality, showed that off, uh, last year uh, at a company called at a conference called Milcom, and we'll be showing our VR stuff pretty soon. And the, the big change, and the, and the reason why OpenRAN is so important to us, the Qualcomm we really needed to build the whole system to do development. And obviously, at Qualcomm we can afford it. Although in the early days we had to do that too, and it was and we were always scrambling for cash, and it was very much consuming the company to figure out how to how to fund the development. With OpenRAN, we got a development system and hardware components from a partner, so that XCOM really could focus on innovation. And the way that we see 
the world and the way that we've lived over the last, uh, I don't know, 30 plus years, all the people that are working together is that um, kind of summed up by this saying that the best way to predict the future is to invent it. And so we want to keep inventing the future at XCOM and building the next new wireless technologies. And when it came to ORAN, we always saw ORAN less about the disaggregation play um, and that not seeing that as the innovation, but rather seeing ORAN as a platform for innovation, which is important to the subject of this uh, this uh, seminar, which is you know around how new entrants and the cloud players and the chipset players can can enter. And what we saw was that you know, obviously with the interoperability play, you know in early days interoperability is hard to get. Everybody has implemented things slightly differently, but that didn't really matter to us. That wasn't the important factor for us. What was really important for us was that there were defined interfaces in the network and there were chunks of functions in certain elements of the network. And therefore that allowed us to choose where we wanted to um, and innovate. And in particular, we focused our efforts on the, on the DU. Uh, and then we were able to get the other equipment from other, other uh, partners in the ecosystem, which is you know, a really cool aspect of open RAN. Um, and what we were seeing was this was the only way to do it. I mean, it, at Qualcomm, we thought that in order to innovate, you had to actually be able to build the systems uh, because the incumbent network equipment vendors, they didn't really provide open access and they don't really provide it now. We've tried to use some of them as test beds and build on top of them, but that's actually been a failure. They aren't able to use the incumbent systems as test beds for much in the way of third-party innovation. Um, now I have to say also, you know, this isn't all you know uh, rainbows and unicorns. There's a wide variation in performance capabilities across the ORAN ecosystem. So while you think you're just assembling components, it's actually not quite as simple as as that. But actually, it's this notion that there is this platform and there are these defined interfaces, which have been so so important for us. And the reason why we didn't go after the disaggregation aspect of it was that we felt strongly that disaggregation was always going to lead to commoditization and that was not going to fund the kind of r d and risk taking that that we wanted to do and that really helped drive things when we were at qualcomm okay so why is it now a good time for all of us to jump into this you know network equipment which used to be a, a very red ocean why do why do we think that's you know gotten blue and obviously, you know, there's this desire, strong desire for U.S. leadership and the government's, you know, giving funding and, you know, not just for innovation, but also because the pandemic highlighted digital divide and we got to figure out how to serve more people uh, more cost effectively. Uh, obviously, geopolitics is a big aspect of it. I mean, Huawei's absent from a number of important markets and that's opened an opportunity and the incumbents. Uh, the other incumbents have been hurt in that battle, I would say, and, and that's obviously, um, you know, affects their ability to take risk and, and makes them somewhat more defensive. Um, you know, now there's a lot of spectrum flexibility. There's, uh, you know, talk a lot about CBRS availability in the U.S., we talk about unlicensed bands, industrial bands in other parts of the world, uh, some, you know, terrestrial bands from other uh, satellite providers, for example. So there's more spectrum. Uh, fiber rolling out. There's more fiber around. Obviously, you know, it's, uh, edge compute and uh, is super interesting aspect of this. Uh, you know, with uh, people talking about not just having their cloud services in, in large data centers, but also man managing on-premises servers. And many, many companies are looking at how they provide an edge by uh, providing low latency links to nearby data centers. So now you can do a lot of the compute uh, without having, to, you know. Uh, obtain a lot of hardware and so that's you know now is really a good time okay so then who are we doing this for um you know and as i said earlier it, a lot of it was just that disaggregation play with mobile network operators looking for cost benefits and i would say that was really the initial driver of open ramp but where i see a, a big opportunity and i think many people see this and think this is a unique insight but the the you have a horizontal market of private networks and the interesting thing about that business, I would say, is that it's solution led. So it creates this larger number of potential customers who have some job to be done. Um, it's unlike selling into a traditional mobile network operator. We have long periods of times in the lab and then 
out in the field as you gradually build uh, their confidence in, in your capabilities. So this is, a, this is a larger pool that you can go after. And that pool of customers, as we've been talking to them, have frustration with Wi-Fi because it's not reliable enough for their mission critical applications. They're also frustrated when they look at cellular trying to tailor a mainstream commercial wireless offering to the specifics of their needs. So there is obviously many, many private networks that will be done by the mainstream uh, mobile network operators, but there is this opportunity for private networks as well. And it's because, like I said, it's less focused on the, on the list of features for a broad offering than it is finding the solution to the issue that that private network or that enterprise um, needs to have, have solved. And these companies generally are used to dealing with Wi-Fi. Their IT departments are used to dealing with Wi-Fi. They generally need a complete solution, um, either from the equipment vendor or from the system integrator. And we, we saw that early on, particularly for high performance applications, where if you don't do it end to end, you really are gonna have a hard time managing particularly like latency uh, sensitive applications. Somebody will throw buffers in somewhere in the system. All of a sudden, you ha you have to go chasing down where the latency is. So you need to provide the complete solution. That's one of the things that we we did at XCOM, and I think the cloud vendors are you know trying to provide the platform for that to to occur in in the open RAN ecosystem too. So the, so the the tech roadmap that we see. I mean, we started out in this journey from analog to 5G. And, and beyond and you know, focused on uh, improving wireless performance. And the early days, it was about you know, modulation and coding, but we quickly ran out of that. We hit the Shannon limit. There's a theoretical limit of how good you can do with that. So then we went to more spectrum. You got a lot of throughput in your systems just because we use wider channels and sort of millimeter wave is the you know, ultimate wider channel, which is you know, uh, part of 5G now. We then, went for a denser systems, more reuse, small cells. But small cells, we found they hit a limit. Uh, you end up with too many small cells in the area, you get too many overlapping handoff regions and they sort of saturate. So what we're focused on is joint processing. And it means exploiting compute capability to give incremental, actually more than incremental, dramatic improvements um, in throughput. And that's, that's the new area and OpenRAN is very well suited towards um, enabling joint processing where things are done in a central area that's also a very cloud or edge uh, uh, kind of notion. Things are, you know, there's there will be compute scattered around the landscape to do the processing for the wireless systems. So really interesting tech roadmap here. And we see going forward, there's gonna be peer to peer in the future and sort of blurring the lines between infrared and devices. But right now we're very focused on this joint processing aspect. And what it allowed us to do was solve for this hype of, of 5G around throughput and latency and reliability. And this, this centralized processing and open RAN, it allowed us to, as I said, turn comp computation into throughput. So we know how to build it even better in future standards, but it works with existing standards. And it's easy to deploy like Wi-Fi, where we can, you know, it, systems can self-manage their interference. They can um, actually take interference and overlap and turn it into capacity. And unlike some, up, you know, some things that people are doing to try and make cellular look like Wi-Fi through a management interface. This is an actual system design that we have that uh, causes the overlaps to be actually constructive instead of destructive. And from the chip standpoint, there's no question that there are there's math to be done and hardware acceleration can improve, can improve the performance of that, reduce cost, size, and power. There's obviously a lot of SOC opportunities in the and the radio units to reduce cost, size, and power. And that's definitely something we wanna do. We wanna be able to put out more radios so we get this densification and therefore the increase, increase in capacity, increase in reliability, and, and so forth. Okay, so kind of let's turn to what, you know, what's the killer app? You know, because everybody always asks that. Every G transition we ever lived through, we had to decide what, what was the canonical application that would set the design specs for the system. And I would say generically, what I what I would say in the case of 5G and this open RAN uh, evolution is is this ability to move compute to the network side of the link, so into the cloud or into the edge, and we can then have lighter and lower power client devices, user devices, and we had this exact experience 
we were doing some work for a location-based entertainment company that were, where you were going on in virtual reality, wearing the goggles, but you had 22 pounds of equipment on your back because you were carrying the compute and the battery to power that compute on your back. Obviously not very consumer friendly over the long term, couldn't stay in that environment for very long. What we all want in the future is just, you know, our glasses just to work and to give us the information we want or immerse us when we want to be immersed. The other benefit of moving compute to the network side of the link is there's far less constraints for application developers. So much easier, much easier to do, much less uh, time to market so they can get stuff on, you know, out quickly. And the other benefit is when new components come around, in the case of the LBE company, they were gonna have to redesign their whole user device, this whole, all this 22 pounds of equipment, a new GPU, a new CPU, new hardware accelerators. If it's in the, in the edge, in the cloud, you just upgrade it. And then the device that's on with the user gets the benefit. And the other, other benefit um, at a high level is, is bounded latency. So we figured out how to bound the latency in, in the systems. And there are certain things that you do there. And that's very important for a lot of these high performance applications. Things like XR, things like the metaverse. And latency is really important because a late frame is a lost frame. If you try and use a late frame, people are gonna get sick. It's, they're not gonna track their head movement. Um, you need to have very high reliability as well. If you have glitches, it breaks the illusion, breaks the immersion. Um, you can provide cinematic quality because you're not limited by the GPU that's on the user side. You can put as, throw as much GPU at it as you want on the uh, on the on the cloud side, and uh, and these things, I, I think this XR metaverse hype that's here clearly is starting with enterprise applications. We see a lot of interest in that, but we're moving to consumer as really. I think it's the R and D on the on the head mounted display that's going to drive that. Other other killer app that we see is real time video. We're building things for uh, swarms of drones that want to do inspection of infrastructure and send information back. Uh, autonomous vehicles, which are autonomous most of the time, but every so often need to be teleoperated when they get into a jam. So semi-teleoperated vehicles, I would say. Uh, robots, a lot of interest in robots in, in uh, logistics and healthcare and all sorts of areas. And uh, as Diane was saying, I'm involved in sports. So sports is really interesting. Uh, we have real-time video. We did a project early on where there's so much latency in the system that when you were watching the video on your phone, the players that were at one end of the court when in real life they were already at the other end of the court. You can't put up with that if you're going to use it for things like sports betting or you want to get stats on the game as you're watching. So lots of different interesting performance, uh, high performance applications that are out there that will require both cloud capabilities and new uh, semiconductors as well. And I, I would just end by saying the way that we see all of this Revolution is that Open RAN is this platform for innovation and treating it as a platform for innovation creates a virtuous cycle. We're increasing the value and the capabilities of the system and therefore what we can bring to a customer that will fund continued innovation. And that is you know, a really nice virtuous cycle that I've lived through before. We expect to live through here as well. And it's true for cloud vendors, chip suppliers, application developers, as well as of course the network equipment vendors. So thanks, I look forward to hearing from everyone else in this and uh, turn it back to you, Diane. Great, thanks, Paul. We appreciate your uh, time and attention to these issues. Um, next, we have a panel. So I will call uh, Prakash Sangram, who's the founder of um, Tantra Analysts. Prakash, thank you so much for joining us today and leading this conversation. Um, we appreciate your time and your attention and we really look forward to hear what the panelists have to say excellent thank you dan hello everyone good morning afternoon or evening depending on where you are thanks for tuning in we indeed have a very interesting subject at hand and paul has really given a great key note into get, getting us started there and uh, we hope to have an interesting conversation continuing his thought process there in terms of open land and how it is enabling lot of many new things in the telecom world and as dan mentioned the topic is role of cloud providers and semiconductor providers in open ran and we are fortunate to have paul as well as an excellent diverse panel uh, to discuss this subject with uh, representing both the 
two domains mentioned here, the cloud side as well as the chipsets and the you know, uh, semiconductor side. Let me start with some quick introductions. As Dan mentioned, I'm Prakash Sangam. I'll be moderating this session. I'm founder and the principal of Tantra Analyst. We are a, a boutique tech industry analyst firm covering 5G, AI, IoT, and other tech areas. I personally have more than 20 years of experience in the telecom industry, working for AT&T, Ericsson, and Qualcomm in my previous life. I write for Forbes, RCR, Fierce Wireless, and other publications, and I'm a 3GPP member, and also host a podcast called Tantra's Mantra, looking at uh, the tech news headlines and so on. Enough about me. Now let's introduce our esteemed panelists. I would like uh, each of them to give a brief introduction of themselves, their companies, and also briefly mention the biggest challenge and the biggest opportunity that they see in Open RAN from their specific business point of view. Again, it's uh, you know, your introduction, your company's introduction, and answer quickly answer the question: What is the biggest opportunity that they see in Open RAN, as well as the biggest challenge they see from specifically their uh, business point of view. Let's start with uh, Cheryl and uh, followed by Gillis, Nick and Howard. Cheryl. Wonderful, thank you very much. Uh, so I'm Cheryl Davis, uh, Senior Director of Strategic Initiatives at Oracle. Uh, I'm based in our DC office. Uh, in my position, I have the opportunity to work with a host of experts uh, across Oracle on all manner of topics, uh, including cloud computing and 5G, and as a 5G core provider, as well as a hyperscale cloud provider, we're actively engaged in all things 5G. So I'm very happy to have the opportunity to be here today. So first, from an opportunity perspective, you know, we're very eager for the opportunities that will come from Open RAN and how cloud can play an integral role moving forward, uh, including in enabling enterprise 5G deployment or hosting some Open RAN components in the cloud. And as 5G is, is built in the cloud with software taking over uh, network elements that were previously relied on um, in, in proprietary hardware, including in the RAN, you know, we're looking forward to 5G continuing to open the door to increase market competition uh, and more frequent innovation cycles, uh, benefiting carriers and enterprises deploying 5G. Um, and from a challenge perspective, uh, I think it'll be important to continue uh, developing and refining the requisite skills and tool sets to ensure that we can realize 5G uh, and do so securely. Thank you. Thank you. Gilles? Thank you. Thank you. So I'm Gilles Garcia. I'm the Senior Director Business Lead uh, for the Data Center and Communications Group at AMD. So thank you, uh, Prakash, and thank you to the Open Run Policy Coalition to have us here. So uh, AMD is a, a big and large company, a leader on the adaptive computing. Um, uh, and, and the goal in life is to provide more compute and build great product to provide the compute closer to the end user. And so uh, Paul has been talking about innovation, compute, and I think that that's probably the, the things that are around the opportunity and the challenge. So let me start with the opportunity. We are a component provider. Uh, I'm coming from the Xilinx acquisition uh, through AMD. So we are focusing, uh, and AMD is, has a strong focus on the uh, RAN market, uh, including the VRAN. And then, of course, the, the biggest opportunity is we have all the technology available already to answer the challenges of this uh, ecosystem. So we have the right CPU for the right performance, efficient in power, focusing on security with embedded security features that are very critical for the, uh, the VRAN uh, security aspect. On the radio, we have also devices that allow all the uh, innovation that Paul was talking about. And by the way, Cheryl was talking about innovation as well. So it's important to have those technologies that are already available. And I would say the biggest challenge we have seen is probably uh, as an industry make in two to three years what the traditional vendors made in 20 years. So I think that at the end, we all need to realize that this open run industry is trying to make in three years what the others has made 20 years to make and going through the different Gs. And we are all for the challenge. I think that the ecosystem is ready. We are still uh, finalizing as an industry some TNCs, and Paul mentioned about uh, open standards mean that they are open. So uh, we still need to uh, hook these. But uh, I think that those challenges are about to be uh, solved. And we uh, will start uh, in the second half of the year in, at this industry level, much more open run deployment. And definitely from the AMD, the technology is ready. 
Thank Back you. to you, President. All right, thanks. Nick? Thank you, Prakash. So, I'm Nick Carter. I'm responsible. I'm the Director of Ecosystem and Strategic Marketing for Analog Devices. Analog Devices is the leading provider of radio transceivers and infrastructure that goes into infrastructure. Um, we have been supplying uh, radio chipsets for over 20 years into basically living through the transition from 3G to 5G. Um, so we're already in, largely embedded in most of the infrastructure that's deployed today. Open RAM provides an opportunity for analog to develop what is effectively the edge portion of a compute platform. If you believe in, in the cloud being more, and I'm going to use some open RAM architecture nomenclature, if the cloud is DU and CU, the edge basically is the RU, and there there's a lot of opportunity to do acceleration and do further digital integration. To, to Paul's earlier point, there's still opportunity to do innovation around software that runs on the RU, but at the same time, there's a lot of digital integration that goes with the, with the radio components, and that's the opportunity that OpenRAN has created for companies like Analog to create more digital content to supply the infrastructure that goes into open radio solutions. And the challenge, uh, Nick? Well, the challenges are fundamentally the interoperability between these various units. And uh, I think as we go through the, the, uh, the list of questions, we're going to expose some of that. But in the software in the front, the front hall that goes between these two ends of the network, the edge and the cloud, that's the biggest challenge we recognize is the ability to do that integration. Okay, very well, thank you. Howard? Hi everyone, uh, I'm Howard Wu. I work for Quanta Cloud Technology. I'm the global head of networks as well as general manager for our US region. Um, Quanta today is one of the world's leading uh, ODM system companies. So in terms of relevance to this particular subject matter today, we work with uh, semiconductor and chip vendors to turn their uh, products into a system and we're one of the leading providers of system infrastructure into cloud service providers. So that's sort of where we live in the universe. Um, I think the, the opportunity for us is, of course, we've seen sort of on the IT side the last 40 years of focusing on a particular component and the disaggregation of entire industry, whereas a system company 40 years ago looks very different than a uh, OEM vendor of today. Um, that has happened on the IT side or the compute side for the last 40, uh, four plus decades. We haven't really seen that type of innovation and speed on the communication side. So as we sort of take our journey in the past, which was, you know, part of, uh, you know, providing hardware to the internet service providers and then moving storage onto the network and then finally moving compute onto the network, one could argue that the cloud revolution was part of the centralization effort of a lot of compute resources. Um, I think going forward, um, and then that's really our opportunity, given that we are, our core competence is, I think everybody who's been through this COVID thing the last two plus years is now realizing the importance of supply chain uh, down to your own household management of toilet paper acquisition. Um, so, um, you know, in, in this world today, we are extremely good at the distribution, creation, manufacturing, supply chain, et cetera. Um, so taking that, that, that is really our opportunity at hand in terms of the proliferation of semiconductor across multiple industries and multiple verticals. Um, in terms of the challenges, I would argue uh, the biggest challenge is probably on two sides. Uh, first is we're coming really into the end of a, um, you know, five century plus of industrialization process. And through the industrial age, we've gotten really good at centralized centralization and standardization. Uh, going forward into the information age, we're going to be dealing with DeFi, a distributed network, a different wave of working and as well as democratization of a lot of things that we got used to the last uh, five centuries plus. On the other hand, in terms of the network and the communications uh, industry, I think it's the fine balance of capital allocation and risk management. So 
how far do I, how fast do I want to run and how much resource do I want to allocate into this process uh, in terms of uh, providing services and providing use cases. All right, thank you. Thank you to all of you and great to you, great to have all of you here. We had, you know, interesting discussion. So a uh, quick note, we'll take questions from audience. So please do keep them coming. You can type them in the Q&A section of the portal. So, you know, coming to the subject, as we all know, Open RAN, and as, you know, uh, many of our panelists mentioned, has seen strong traction recently. Some might even call it hype, and looking at how much attention it is getting. Uh, there is one uh, commercial large-scale network in Japan, right? That's all we have right now, but there is another one coming here in the U.S. Both of them are greenfield deployments. But what we also have is lots and lots of trials, announcements of smaller networks, uh, you know, from the world's leading operators. Almost all uh, major infra, cellular infra vendors support Open RAN, uh, some more than others, but they do support it, except for one, if I recall. And uh, Open RAN promised to significantly lower the entry barrier, enabling many small and medium players and so on, right? So with that backdrop, let's start first with some basic definition. You know, often, this cloud native, virtual, open RAN, VRAN are all combined as together as one subject. But actually they are separate parts, separate concepts, each of their uh, benefits and so on. Of course, all of them are connected and ultimate you know, uh, objective is to have a multi-vendor, fully open, virtualized uh, you know, RAN as such. Uh, but I want to pick your brains on why we need these specific parts in an open RAN, why do we need, for example, cloud native? Why do you need it to be fully virtualized and so on? Let's start with Howard. Howard, any views on that? Sure. Um, having uh, been through the cloud computing sort of revolution, I remember in the early days of cloud, or we didn't even call it cloud, call it virtual private servers, right? Um, it was there was a lot of skepticism in the marketplace as well in terms of adoption. And I think at the end of the day, virtualization, if you if you just take a look at some of the path that some of the large uh, cloud service providers took, uh, you know, one way is what we call the hardware virtualization, right? Which is you, you, you take a, a typical hypervisor and then you partition the hardware on top. Um, at the end of the day, I think it comes down to efficiency and operations, right? So uh, what we do know is the speed of compute and delivery systems is way faster than the speed of adding capacity in terms of electricity. So how do I take fixed electrical capacity and do more with it? And that really requires the virtualization layer that sits between you know your application, your operating system, and it really depends on what you're willing to give up, right? In, in a VM world, uh, you're not giving up your operating system and your sort of root access in a you know uh, software virtualized world you're giving up a lot of the operating system file system for example and really focusing on the speed and agility of delivering your application and so i think in terms of open ran if service providers want the flexibility because we're no longer running single type applications right we're running a variety of use cases it could be autonomous driving could be mobile gaming uh, could be devices or applications that needs to sit on the far edge with a, you know, potentially a GPU and a CPU sits, or in the cases of latency, that doesn't matter. It can relay all the way back to a data center. So how do you really build a fully adjustable sort of efficient and cost optimized uh, network while it being extremely secure, right? And I think that is the, that is what um, virtualization as a key component gives you the flexibility to software define this entire hardware infrastructure. Thank you, Cheryl. Who's that? Sure. So I'll, I'll give a few thoughts on uh, virtualization as well as uh, the importance of, of cloud native. Um, so on, on virtualization of the RAN, right, from our perspective, uh, with similar to comments um, made previously, this prevents just more op options for the network operators since these platforms are, are software based and should be able to run on any hardware platform right network operators no longer need to procure end-to-end -end network wide solutions from a single vendor uh, and they have an opportunity to select from different suppliers right, the best solution for the network 
and they'll have more uh, deployment flexibility, um, all good for security resilience uh, in the function of their, their network. Um, and on the importance of cloud native as well, you know, we really look at cloud native as a critical building block of, of 5G. Um, it's the most optimal method of virtualization when running workloads in the cloud. And it's more efficient, it offers better scale, it's standard-based uh, for interoperability and portability, uh, and allows for inter uh, automation, excuse me. So with 5G's uh, architecture and the elasticity of the cloud, right, adopting a cloud-native approach will really allow operators to be much more agile. Uh, and so this is how, by embracing this approach, we'll be able to unlock this, the power of, of 5G. Well, less. So let me focus, since uh, Howard and Cheryl has been focusing on the cloud native, let me focus on the difference between VRAN and Open RAN. Uh -huh. uh, and Open RAN means really that you have open interfaces between the different blocks, where VRAN means that you are virtualized, but you have still proprietary interfaces between the radio and the DU, the DU and the CU, and by the way, even on potential on the 5G core. So that's for me the big difference is, the open RAN can be also virtualized, of course, because we are leveraging on the open RAN the 3GPP disaggregation and the ORAN alliance specification, but everything is based on open standard interfaces. And that's what really for, for make the big difference between the VRAN, which is more traditional vendors, and the open VRAN also, which is really the open uh, RAN with virtualization, cloud native, but then open interfaces and innovation capability at each layer from the radio and Nick was talking about that very important to have innovation integration uh, digital compute as well in the in the radio but big capability on the frontal as well to be able to uh, to bring uh, all the, the traffic to the DU on the DU you will need to have accelerator that will have to be virtualized uh, or up level with all the cloud infrastructure software that are available today and then the baseband and potentially offloaded and we'll discuss that later on but these are innovations that are coming at each layer with the open interfaces that are defined yeah. Nick so a lot of the time discussion is on DU I think there is you uh, know uh, are you specific implementation and specific you know uh, impact and benefits of this as well being a big are you supplier and vendor uh, components to our RU ecosystem would love to hear your, your view on this as well well i mean let me take a step back and address a broader issue which we've uh -huh. heard from operators directly the ability uh -huh. to take control of software development which is <clears throat> fundamentally the value proposition around virtualization the separation of the hardware compute from the software development and the ability to secondarily take control of that and do their own development either directly or through contractors is one of the big benefits of, of open radio. Now, it is a true statement, open and virtual are, you know, I kind of described this, one is a horizontal, a sort of a vertical partition between elements, and the other is a horizontal partition between software and the hardware underneath it, virtualization being horizontal partitioning. Having, having made that distinction, um, even in the RU, which is heavily, as I stated in my opening, more of an edge device appliance than it is a virtual or cloud-based um, platform. Even there, there's opportunity to innovate and develop code on an RU that basically runs a management plane. So even in the RU, which is heavily accelerated, heavy hardware dependence, you can't virtualize uh, the actual RF, right, by definition. Uh, yeah. Even there, there's opportunities to put develop code that's unique and differentiates um, the service for an operator. And there's innovation around multi-operator deployments and other things that can be done even within an RU, which is heavily hardware-centric. Thank you. So, so uh, when you're looking at cloud-native and cloud-based architectures and you know, deployments, the natural questions operators face is, whether to go towards uh, use utilize public cloud or build their own private cloud, and we have you know examples of both of these. If you look at U.S. market, Verizon has said the categorically that they want to build their own uh, private cloud, whereas Dish is going with Amazon's public uh, cloud. And of course, each has their uh, pros and cons. So, would like to pick your brains on uh, you know, what you guys think. What would be the best option, and what are the some of the 
best case scenarios in either of the options you take. Again, let's start with uh, Cheryl, then go to Howard after that. Sure, thank you. Um, so I'll offer that the strength of, of public cloud is that you have hyperscale cloud providers who can leverage their scale and expertise to offer secure and performant cloud solutions to customers. Right? This is a good option because then cloud providers are able to concentrate all of their resources, uh, their engineering and expertise on securing the cloud, which also translates into improved security for any service um, running on that cloud environment, including uh, 5G. Um, and on private cloud, I'll also offer that this doesn't necessarily have to be a cloud developed or managed by a non-cloud provider. Um, there are some cloud providers who will offer different deployment models, uh, and they can deploy a private or dedicated cloud uh, on the premises of a customer, um, whether it be for their preference or to meet uh, regulatory or legal requirements. So in this manner, if the customer can still leverage the expertise and scale of the cloud provider to operate and secure the cloud, uh, and then that customer can deploy their expertise to where they need. So, you know, the underlying message here is to leverage the cloud that fits your needs, uh, and that can be operated and secured by those who have the right expertise, who this implementation here is key. Um, and, you know, with 5G, there's just a real opportunity then to leverage the expertise of those, those cloud providers. Thank you. Howard? Yeah, that's a good question. And I think that's one where every operator is evaluating. And there's no one size fits all answer because it comes down to a business model decision, right? For most of the operators, they have to evaluate, number one, do I have the engineering chops? Is that an internal or is that an external resource that I'm utilizing to manage my own private cloud, even if I acquire the infrastructure and the hardware and the systems? Uh, and then the second part is how does that benefit um, sort of my business model and how does that return capital to my shareholders, right? So uh, for, for some service providers, and, and it's hard to just say, oh, all the brown fields are going to do one thing and all the green fields are going to do another, because we clearly, even in the green fields, we see uh, different uh, service providers taking different path in terms of what is a outsourced component versus what is a in-house component. Um, so I think at the end of the day, it depends on what they want to do with their network, the availability of their partners. But I think it's for most of the service providers, and, and this is one key aspect I think uh, all of them are thinking about, which is, are we transitioning into a data-driven world? And so if data is the new, new gold or new oil, whatever you want to call it, you know, uh, expensive commodity, right? Um, do you want to own that data? Or are you comfortable having that data pass through a partner's, you know, whether it's a public network or a public cloud, or how do you want to monetize that asset? And how do you want to uh, control and secure that asset? And so I think that those are the deciding factors that most of the uh, service providers we talk to when, when consideration. In-house capabilities, the importance of data and the control and management and secure, the security of it, and then also how comfortable am I with the availability of a public cloud partner. Anyway, so uh, Gilles and Nick, do you have any op opinion on that or I can move to the uh, chips related question. So just to be sure, since we have two separate domains and topics, I'll straddle between yeah. the two so that everybody gets a fair share of the uh, questions, right? So uh, then, then let's move on to the, the chipset part of it now. So um, when virtualization and open RAN started, uh, the notion was COTS, the you know commercial off the shelf uh, compute will be good enough to handle all the telecom workloads. But I mean, as people started implementing, they realized that you know just the COTS doesn't cut it, especially for high and low uh, layer one, uh, uh, workloads. So, um, you know, the, the kind of uh, accelerators needed and so on. So what is your view on it? You think accelerators are needed, hardware accelerators, specific accelerators, or you think cord specific, uh, the regular compute will be able to handle all the workloads? Uh, let's so, start with the list. Yeah. So definitely, again, from the AMD perspective, the, the code server, they can handle the different workload. The question is, what is the most efficient uh, yeah. green from a power perspective and, and bandwidth perspective, what is the most uh, suitable option for that? And Howard was saying that for the cloud, there is not one size fit all. I think it's similar here. One size does not fit all. 
definitely when you are virtualizing the DU and you have multi sectors or multi towers coming to the uh, to the uh, DU definitely accelerator uh, are mandatory and you will have accelerators that will do baseband offload uh, inline or look aside and we can discuss later on if you want about that but accelerator will be required and after that which type of accelerators uh, GPU uh, FPGAs ASICs again since a lot of different workloads uh, exist depending of the radio that you have is it a 44 r is it a massive mimo what is the spectrum that you have it is multi-sector it is multi-run uh, run sharing multi-operator so all those workloads are impacting the, the the load on the cpus on the cots server and so could determine the need of accelerator and in fact working with operators we have to go through the traffic model with them because of course they have also the 4g <laughs> To consider 4G is not disappearing, so they need to mix. And so this is really analyzing the traffic model of the operators that will determine which type of COTS server you will need and which type of accelerator you will you need. Definitely, FPGAs have the capability to be adapt uh, and adaptive. And in fact, FPGAs, it's more adaptive SOCs that we're talking about here. It's a kind of hybrid between FPGA, ASIC, and GPU all in one. And so those things can really adapt to different workloads and even adapt and change depending of the evolution of the tower or the DU configurations. So again, definitely I think that, again, I provided a portion of the answer and uh, I'm sure that Nick will have his, his own view. Yeah, Nick. So again, my I'm gonna focus on our domain, which is the RU. And again, I hope not to get too technical, but in the RU, you have a couple of basic important functions. One is the physical layer. The, the, it's called the lo-fi in the partitions put forth by the Open RAN Alliance. <clears throat> in addition, you have the actual data conversion, and then you have the RF, which is the power amplifiers and it feeds the antenna. So it's, high, as I stated in my opening, um, thesis is heavily hardware dependent. And it's actually the part where if you optimize, you can impact being green uh, the most. Because, I mean, you have a couple of elements here. You have compute elements which consume power. You have power amplifiers which consume power. And the idea is to develop, is to minimize the power consumption of all these elements. Hardware acceleration is the best way to achieve a green platform, if you will, particularly around the compute side. Furthermore, um, some of these functions are actually have to be done in hardware, whether it's FPGA or whether it's a dedicated ASIC, due to things, due to latencies and other issues. And you know, again, there's a vertical and horizontal partition. The horizontal partition here has to do with the control and data planes, which are highly, which need very low latency processing. Again, this is geared more towards hardware than it is to something that runs on a GPU or CPU. So in particular, hardware acceleration is particularly valuable in the RU. Yes, there are functions that are less latency sensitive, that require more flexibility, that can be um, supported through CPUs, and, and that's the typical architecture you see from the chips that are out there. But the data plane and the control plane in particular should be hardware accelerated. Okay, very well. Howard, did you have any opinion on it? Howard? I'm good. Okay, sorry. Perfect. Okay, yeah, no problem. So, okay, so then, um, I guess you quickly, you know, uh, mentioned about it. So, the, the hardware accelerator can be either FPGA, ASICs, or GPU, right? And they could be either inline versus look aside accelerators. So, how do you see these i mean and obviously a lot of it de also depends on uh, the vendors who are providing it if one pro one uh, vendor is providing a specific solution then they would say that is the best solution so generally i, I think there is role for each of these depending on the deployments yep. and so on so so where do you think fpgas make sense where do you think asic uh, makes sense and where do you gpus make sense and also inline versus look aside, uh, you know, in general scheme of things, especially for DU. 
So let me let me start then on the reverse order. I will start by the inline look aside, okay. and after that, put what are the best the best options for the two. So uh, mm -hmm. when when people starting to realize that accelerator were a must, they starting to look at what can be accelerated. And on the DU side, we're talking about the DU side. And so the baseband is, of course, the main function of the DU. Mm -hmm. And on the baseband, the SDFEC was the biggest portion that the CPU and the cores on the DU were spending time to do. And that's probably not the right placement for this functionality. So this mm -hmm. is where the look aside function started, the accelerator look aside, the L1 look aside, started to offload the SDFEC, all the LDPC encoding, decoding from the baseband to an accelerator. Now let's stay on this one and I will talk in line later on. What are the best options there? So at the end, it's a PCI Express card. So mm -hmm. PCI Express slots need to be sub 75 watt. So I think that if a L1 look aside function can fit into a sub 75 watt, that's potentially a good solution. And that's probably remove some GPU accelerator cards that are more consuming by definition than FPGAs or ASIC base. Then between FPGA or adaptive SOCs and ASICs, the main difference is the flexibility. Are you doing an accelerator for a single function? Or do you want to have, for example, your frontal termination? Because we talk about, Nick was talking about the biggest things coming from the RU to the DU was the frontal. Do you want the frontal to be processed in the DU? Or do you want to offload the, the frontal termination as well? Mm -hmm. And so for the look aside, we have seen that FPGAs doing a frontal termination and uh, uh, L1 look aside was a very good compromise. But we are still, we are also seeing AZ card or similar AZ card available in the market. Move to the L1 inline. Operators realize that DU are quite costly in general because that's a code server that you need to have. Imagine the L1 inline as a DU on a card. You do not have any more DU or almost. You still have the FAPI interface to the CU side, but the L1 in line is you are offloading the complete baseband processing into an accelerator card. And by the way, it's still a PCI Express card. So is it a single slot sub 75 watt, or is it a dual slot uh, around the 140 watt that you are taking? And that's again driving, if you can fit a sub 75 watt accelerator card doing L1 in line, what is the workload capabilities that you can drive? Massive MIMO or only 44R? All of those are KPIs that will be discussed with the operator to determine what, what, is, the, what is or are the best options for the L1 in line. Some people are saying, oh, ASICs are the uh, ultimate goal, but then ASICs will have the issue to cope with all the different complexity of the 3GPP from all the radio uh, perspective, where some adaptive SOCs will have the capability to still be very high performance, fitting into the sub 75 watt and being able to drive a massive MIMO inline solution. So again, of course, AMD will have the best solution. So, but that's a, that's a fact, but it, the, more, the more I think that what, and, and what uh, joking aside, and I'm not joking on that, but the decision will have to be taken by what is the configuration that you want to have? What are the KPI of the operator? Do the operator is doing the virtualized DU into an edge data center or is it at the bottom of the tower? Because that will depend the number of sectors and the number of towers. So sorry to have been taking so long. All right. Thank you, Nick. So going, you're, you're going back to restating the question, which is, I think you said it's GPU, CPU versus ASIC. Is that kind of the basis? Yeah, so an inline versus... Uh, oh, on the L1 inline. So, so, I mean, I'm, I'm familiar with the architecture that Gilles just described, which is more of a DU-centric. Right. Inline versus um, side-loading is more of a DU-centric question. I think I can't really add much to what he gave as a very good answer. If I come back around to the RU, 
I would say that the RU can very much be hardware centric, as I stated okay. earlier. And okay. um, the front hall, for example, on the DU side, for the DU and RU interact through that front hall. Um, it's set and up to, for those of you who are following the specifications. On, on one side, as, as was stated, it, on the DU side, it can be hardware accelerated, and a lot of the implementations are that way. On the RU side, it pretty much has to be. Again, the RU side is the, is the area where you're trying to optimize for green, right? Kermit the mm -hmm. Frog would be very happy being green, because the mm -hmm. front off, that is where you really need to focus on being green and reducing power. And again, that coincides with being uh, moving more towards hardware and ASIC implementations. Yep. Thank you. How did you have any comment on it? Okay. No, I, I think both are great points uh, in terms of, you know, we see the same thing. Uh, probably one of the top concerns is energy. Um, and, and energy today really goes from geopolitics all the way down to your bottom line OPEX, right? So the sourcing of energy, the allocation of energy, we certainly see a, a strong transition into EVs. So not only are we securing the same parts, we're securing the same energy source. And so I think at the end of the day, you know, spinning up electric grids is not something you do overnight, where at least at the end of the day, you can still buy a server relatively faster. So how do we, how do we deploy, how do we manage? And in the plethora of new semiconductor platforms and chipsets, uh, how do you still maintain some type of commonality in terms of the skew counts and not go completely insane on the bookends? Yeah. Hard problems at all. Yeah, <laughs> and hard problems are good, right? Not job security. It's okay. So let's move to the uh, the uh, cloud side uh, now. So um, rather, it's not just cloud; it's across the board, and it's about security, right? So. And the security is obviously a, a basic need and it's a major uh, consideration across the board. And then when you talk to people and you talk to legacy providers versus uh, Open RAN and also Chipset and Cloud and uh, everybody else, there are differing views. Some say that making it open makes the system much more vulnerable for uh, security risks as such. Um, and others say that uh, being it open, you have many participants. so you can provide the best uh, security. On the other side, if you look at the legacy vertically integrated system, they say since all part of the same system, you can look at security in a much better way and secure the system in a much better way. So I want to you know, pick your brains on it. Let's start with uh, Sharil on uh, how to address the issue and whether open is more secure versus closed uh, and so on. Sure, sure. So from our perspective as a, as a cloud provider, right, uh, yeah. and in case 5G transition from this purpose-built hardware to, to software and cloud. Um, you know, we view cloud as, as a new opportunity to shift the security advantage, right? So 5G being built in the cloud can inherit the cloud scale, reliability, uh, and security, which you know, alluded to before, uh, allowing capabilities to be rapidly deployed uh, and scaled and segmented um, with tailored security measures. Um, you know, further embedded uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning capabilities, which are key to scaling security, uh, can autom autonomously uh, prevent, detect, respond to, uh, and predict sophisticated threats. Um, and then, you know, with network functions, you know, when you're considering uh, core and whatnot, they're carried out in software. Uh, there are other tools, network slicing, containerization, um, that can further enhance security. Um, and on supply chain, right, because 5G is now transitioning to an, an IT-based infrastructure, um, the supply chain is now also shifting to an agile, secure, and diverse IT supply chain, uh, where there are many vendors um, that can enter the space and, and develop these critical capabilities. So, so from our view, you know, while the security landscape is certainly uh, challenging, um, we view cloud as a real opportunity to enhance security for an open, interoperable, and standards-based uh, 5G deployment. Thank you. Howard, do you have any comments there? Yeah, I think, I mean, first and foremost, security is on top of everybody's mind these days, right, in terms of um, uh, access and control. And I think earlier Paul did mention he also saw part of the opportunity inside the private network side, right? And so if we sort of overlap the 5G journey and the open RAN journey to what we saw in sort of the cloud uh, evolution let's say 12 to 15 years ago, 
one could argue the early phases, the always the adoption of the public network, right? So that experienced rapid growth. Then we had security concerns in terms of data and managing workloads. Then you sort of go into a private mode. And at the end of the day, the ecosystem will settle so itself on sort of a hybrid model, right? So we certainly saw that evolution in, in the cloud space going from public clouds, private clouds, you know, hybrid clouds. And I think we're going to see similar things because, um, like I said, there's, you know, unfortunately, there's no one size fits all in this industry. And it, the technology itself has to adopt to the business model. It has to make sense for the PNL, right? So at the end of the day, it comes down to, you know, uh, the end users, or let's talk about enterprise type workloads. How important is, is security in terms of do I want to build a private network and does it connect to a public network? And if it does connect, how what are the interfaces? Um, how does how far on the edge does the data sit? Is that does that present a security risk uh, for that data the further out it sits on top of that edge? So I think I think that's where um, most of the industry is looking at. Uh, and Cheryl's 100% right. It actually starts at controlling, managing, and securing your own supply chain in these days. The availability of semiconductor, of systems, and everything else. Great, thank you. Nick uh, Gilles, any news there? Nick? Yeah, I, I can add something that in, from the Oran uh, specification, I think the oh. Oran Alliance is spending a lot of time. Can you hear me? Yes, yeah, we can hear you now. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can. Okay, so the Oran Alliance is spending a lot of time uh, on defining as part of the specification the security. So for me, it's not a debate of who is more sec secure. Both needs to be secure and both are secure. Now, let me take my hat of chipset vendor. We have been doing on the processor side itself, we have added some embedded security features, especially for the virtualization. Because I think that every piece counts that you are adding to avoid breach into the network. Software, software security, but if you can add also hardware security and control, I, I fully agree with you, Cheryl, that the overall control and orchestration and knowing your ecosystem is important. But if you are embedded, embedding into your CPU security at each VNF level, at the memory level of the VNF, and, and so in some other uh, features that are embedded into the AMD processors, you are adding another layer of security, which is embedded and can be used with almost no impact in the performance aspect or latency. And so I think that nevertheless, we will always find somebody more intelligent than whoever that will do something that is not, I would say, the right things to do. So I think that adding more barriers, software-wise, orchestration-wise, and hardware-wise, and by by looking at the standards as well, is very important for the security. But for me, at the end, Open RAN and VRAN need to be secure and as secure and are as secure as one and the other. I have not heard anything or read in the press any breach into the Rakuten network. They have been doing that for the past two years. Yeah. Dish, yeah. even if it's starting, nothing has been has been done, and I believe that they are clever people thinking about what they need to do. So I think that there is a debate, but I think that instead of having the debate, let's make sure that the interoperability and the ecosystem and the supply chain is secure, and that the, the specifications that are defining the security are implemented. And thank you. And it's it's just one network. It's been only three years, right? So okay, yeah, I get it. And Nick, any news there? Sure. Elevating the discussion again to cloud and edge. I mean, yeah. edge computing and cloud computing have been around. Howard, Cheryl, aware of this, and they've been <laughs> secure outside the telecom environment, outside the radio network, and they've been fairly secure. They've been secure basically. I, but more importantly, bringing it down to the implementation in for an open radio network, Shields is correct. There is a lot of activity going on in, in the ORAN Alliance. I believe it's in working group one. We actually are very active in that, one of those task groups to help define security. And there's security, you have to look at threat and, and the threat attacks and assessments. 
you can be attacked either at the, in our case, into the radio unit. There could be direct physical attacks. There could be attacks into the interface, into the unit. And these working groups are addressing every one of these potential threat, um, threat uh, scenarios. So they're being looked at in the working group. They've been looked at in, as I stated earlier, in previous um, deployments of edge and cloud networks. And this is just a continuation of the security um, paradigm that are being brought into, specifically into an open radio environment. Right, thank you. So uh, let me start the next question with you, Nick. So, you know, I mean, as provider of uh, RU to the legacy provider, uh, infra vendors as well, the legacy system right now, 5G, supports many of the advanced features, be it 64TR, um, you know, carry aggregation across many bands, and so on, right? So, uh, but if you look at the, what is implemented in Open RAN, it's it's not at that level yet. I mean, there are announcements and so on, but if you look at what is available and what is being deployed, it still is not supporting those uh, advanced features, if you will. And going forward, actually, even when you look at your LLC and others, they'll, they'll be even more complex, right? So, knowing that, so where do you think uh, you know the the open RAN industry as such is in addressing these challenges? How soon? I mean, there are announcements and so on. Do you see easy and you know smooth uh, adoption of these advanced features into open RAN, or or see some friction on, in terms of timeline and so on? So I think you're starting to get at more the um, a little more of the ecosystem question because uh -huh. that the answer to your question varies upon the vendor. Uh -huh. and, and I mean, what I'm about to say may be a little bit sacrilegious, but the reality is the more established vendors have mature feature sets. They can uh -huh. still be complying with Open RAN, and then, and a lot of people conflate um, the definition of Open RAN with new and emerging vendors. Yes, it does enable a broad ecosystem, but reality is in existing vendors who have a lot of this code and features that are already developed are in a position to deliver a full, capable solution, even in an open RAN partitioned environment. So that question really is uh, really a question around the uh, definite, I mean, taking a step back at the Orient Alliance, the Orient Alliance points to 3GPP as the master um, standard, standard development organization. It, the feature sets that are in 3GPP are called out by Open RAN. Open RAN is partitioning and trying to implement these features in a virtual environment. Um, and yes, there are the vendors that are developing to both of these SDOs, both 3GPP and the ORAN Alliance, are in various states of development. Very well. Anybody else, else wants to chime in to that question? Okay, Gilles. So uh, I think it's important to know that the same technology is used today by traditional vendors and open run vendors. It's not a question of can the technology make those functionality like run sharing, build a massive MIMO, or support your RLC, or even the release 17, which is coming, which is the satellite, 5G satellite. The technology is here today. And we are shipping it uh, as we speak. So I think the big question is uh, back to Sherry's point: the ecosystem. How the ecosystem is capable to innovate and bring at least at par to not say more than what the traditional vendor is, but for the time being is at least at par from a system perspective. That's what the open run innovation is all about: is bringing a lower capex, lower opex solution with the same type of performance, capability, and flexibility to evolve. We are working with operators on run sharing. The okay. technology is there, and we are seeing with open run uh, vendors that to do a run sharing. Okay. So it's not a question of, of, of is the technology capable, it's more a question of just the ecosystem validating those before putting them in the field. OK. All right, so we're coming uh, to the end of it. Let me ask one ecosystem question and go to my last question. So please be brief. Let me start with Cheryl. So, uh, um, you know, we, you know, a couple of decades ago, there was not even two decades, one decade ago, you had two ecosystems. There was telecom ecosystem, there was IT and cloud ecosystem. They are separate. 
and they treated them to be separate. But with Open RAN, all of them are, you know, combining them, uh, you know, merging now and becoming one large ecosystem. How do you see, you know, that playing out? Do you see any ecosystem differences as such uh, as we move forward? Um, let's start with Cheryl. A quick 30 second answer, maybe. Sure, sure. Uh, so, yeah. I'm not for this just necessarily uh, open RAM that's, that's merging these ecosystems together. You know, 5G writ large certainly uh, is as well. And so, you know, from our perspective, we think, you know, 5G, uh, the ultimate IT modernization project, you know, shifting to this, this IT infrastructure. Um, mm -hmm. And with this, you know, open RAM certainly stands to be a benefactor of the convergence. Um, and, you know, for us, certainly cloud is going to be critical to realizing what 5G was envisioned to be with the uh, needed agility, automation, and security. Um, but I'll add as well um, that on top of, you know, the quick players that we've discussed in the current ecosystem, um, all playing a critical role moving forward. I think we also need to consider more than just the uh, infrastructure side of this, but also what the 5G network can empower. And so those who will be able to build the applications that can leverage this network will also have a critical role going forward in this, this 5G ecosystem. So, you know, a, a lot of players are involved here and, and we're certainly eager to see the evolution in this space. All right, quick, uh, Howard, quickly, 30 seconds. Yeah, the, the ecosystem and the industry itself needs to embrace the uh, Open RAN initiatives, full stop, right? And everybody needs to be able to, um, not to say take the lead, but at least don't stand too long on the sidelines waiting for everybody else to jump into the ecosystem. Um, because, and and really I think uh, a lot of the um, uh, partners in the industry needs to realize what uh, a lot of the things that have been done in the past has not necessarily worked. So how do you take some of those learnings and uh, really adopt into your open RAN overall strategy? Okay, thanks, Gilles. 30 seconds. You're on mute. Again, ecosystem is critical for the success of Open RAN. Okay, perfect. The Open RAN yeah. ecosystem is critical. It's critical for the success. So I think that there is no debate. We need the ecosystem and we need the vibrant ecosystem from cloud to vendors working all together. Perfect. Next. So I think Paul in his opening statement said that one of the drivers towards um, open RAN and, and the development and the investment. I mean, it's great to have standards, but you need money to make it work, right? And, and the, the money that's flowing into the ecosystem is pretty impressive. And it's driven by a void in the ecosystem. Over the, for example, Huawei was cited as no longer being able to sell in certain markets. That has created a void in the market and the ability for other companies to invest and step up and diversify. I made I think it was about a year ago, I was on one of these panels, I made a point that, you know, with, if you go back 20 years, in the United States, you had Motorola, in, in Canada, you had Motorola, Nortel, Lucent, uh, all developing infrastructure, and others in, in the United States, and right now, you really don't have that. Yeah. And, and we kind of let the ecosystem fade away. Now it's time for the ecosystem to come back. Yeah, so uh, let me squeeze one more question. Answer in two uh, sentences only, right? So, uh, with whatever one minute that we have. So, if you have to meet here in say next five years on a panel like this, where do you think Open Ed will be? Let's start with uh, Nick, uh, followed by Gillis, Howard, and then and with Cheryl. Three, two or three sentences. It will be deployed, and it'll be a mix of traditional vendors and emerging vendors. Perfect, uh, Gillis. You're mute. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so ecosystems, the, the, um, the traditional vendors will dominate, but I think that the market share of open run, it will probably be bigger than what we believe it will be. Perfect. Howard? Boy, we didn't think of that five years ago. Sharon? <laughs> uh, yeah, so optimistic uh, on its adoption and, and rollout, and you know, I hope in five years we're going to be talking about all those transformative applications that are going to be riding on on 5G. Perfect. So uh, um, I'm afraid that was our last question, as I mentioned. Um, you know, I think we had a very good uh, you know discussion, wide ranging on these two specific topic topics in Open RAN, which is very which are very important to make Open RAN possible. 
let me thank all of the panelists for an engaging and informative session and of course uh, thanks to all the audience and you know, for joining our discussion and asking uh, some interesting questions uh, indeed it was a great pleasure for me to moderate this panel um, and thank uh, open and policy coalition to for giving us an opportunity to talk about this um, hope to catch you on the next one thank you again thank you all, all right yeah thank